everyone. Don Welsh here with Destinations International, and I want to thank you for taking time from your uh, busy schedules to be with us today on our latest webinar. And as I've said since the beginning, uh, the, since the pandemic uh, started, we've been very fortunate uh, to have such great thought leadership and the sharing of great thoughts and leadership worldwide at Destinations International. And I'm pleased to say that you've got a, an incredible session lined up today uh, with our partners from Canada and the United States to sort of talk about things that are taking place in the meetings industry, but not confine the meetings. And you have a wonderful panel that you're going to be hearing from. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank all of our partners. And with as, as with all of our webinars, you can find those at our learning center at destinationsinternational.org. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity now, if I could, uh, to thank our various partners and sponsors that are with us throughout the year. And uh, in particular today, I'd like to thank uh, our friends at IMEX. And uh, in particular, I wanna thank uh, Ray Bloom and Karina for the great support they provided to Destinations International and our industry for many, many years. And uh, today's discussion is actually brought to you by the IMX group. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over now to uh, our distinguished group of panelists. Today's conversation is gonna be led uh, by our dear friend and partner with MMGY and Next Factor. And Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful conversation. Thanks again for being with us today. And we look forward to hearing what's taking place in uh, Canada and the United States. So Greg, thank you. Thank you, Don, very much. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining our session today, hosted by Destinations International and IMAX. Uh, my name is Greg Oates, Senior Vice President at MMGY Next Factor. We're a consultancy group that works with destination organizations worldwide and we also produce Destination International's Destination Next Future Study every two years. Uh, today we have a great group of leaders to discuss how the business events industry is evolving in North America and where they see opportunities to lead the recovery out of COVID-19. So joining us today are Elliot Ferguson, President and CEO of Destination DC in the US Capitol. He's also the National Chair for the US Travel Association. We have Paul Nursey, President and CEO of Destination Greater Victoria in Western Canada. And we have Chantal Sturk Nadeau, Executive Director of Business Events at Destination Canada. First of all, thank you all very much for your leadership during uh, what is really most likely one of the most challenging years of our professional and personal um, lives. Elliot, let me just start with you. There's never a boring day in US media these days. Just how is that news coming out of the US impacting the meetings and events industry in the US now? What do you see as the potential long-term impacts? Greg, I normally say thanks for starting with me, but I don't know if that's the case uh, in, this, in this particular instance, but it is what it is. Uh, happy to be here with my good friends from, from Canada. Um, you know, I think our reality, um, you know, 2020 has been really interesting for the US. Um, you know, I think that as we look at where we are as a country, um, and equally as much how we're being perceived from a global perspective, we know the, the answer there, uh, and we're not happy with it. Um, I think we're really saddened with um, how we've handled uh, the pandemic as a country. Um, we are not happy with the perception and the types of questions we're getting from a global perspective in terms of uh, what's up in the US. Uh, and it makes it even more interesting and, and, and more difficult for us to do what we do in terms of promoting and marketing our destinations. Um, I think that we're still looking at um, what phase will we be in in the near future in terms of having events in the city. Um, and right now we're in phase two as a destination, therefore no more than 50 people can get together. Um, and, um, you know, as, as we look at the state of affairs, you know, I might as well put it all out there from what we're all dealing with with the pandemic to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, to the unfortunate death of, um, of Supreme Court Justice uh, Ginsburg, which is happening, of course, here in DC, and of course, an election, uh, a very colorful election. Uh, it's been a very interesting time to do what we do and be prepared and engaged to promote our destinations uh, individually and collectively. Okay. You know, Looking at North America now, there's so many differences between the U.S. and Canada. Our company is involved, you know, we do work in both countries and uh, I'm in the U.S. And in the last two months, I've flown through Denver, Phoenix, Charlotte, 
Dallas and others, and those airports feel busy compared to where they were two months ago. Whereas in Canada now, they're still very much just starting to open up. Um, Chantal, can you talk about that and how things are different in Canada relating to how the country is opening up and the recovery of business events in general? Yeah, sure. Um, like everyone, uh, you know, we've been hit pretty hard. And um, I think one of the things that I've noticed is when we start to look at Canada and doing, you know, we're looking at how the numbers are in our own country. And you're always looking at how, how those numbers are, are, are impacting globally and uh, especially uh, to our neighbors to, to the south. Um, we, you know, we very much tightened up everything from our borders and when I'm saying everything I mean even our provinces so you know if you look at over the last eight months um, the numbers have been relatively uh, good in terms of low um, we are you know they've been up and down in different provinces uh, but it's been a very strong tightening of every uh, provincial health leader in every province that has a different number in terms of gathering numbers um, you know, everything from 50 in BC, uh, all the way up to 250 in Montreal currently right now. But what everybody has done is they've, they've really gone domestic. They've gone to domestic programs, to domestic campaigns, to try and get everybody to really understand not, uh, you know, not only the safety and protocols that everyone has been doing a wonderful job across our country from our branded hotels to our convention centers, um, to our leisure uh, partners as well in terms of attractions and restaurants. Um, but it, it really has been, uh, there's different rules and regulations by province. So here in Manitoba, uh, I would have to quarantine if I come go to the east, I'd have to be quarantined back home for 14 days. If I go to the west, there is no quarantining. The Atlantic, in terms of the Maritimes, have a bubble. They can travel within the Atlantic, but uh, either than that, there's very much a quarantine. So the numbers have been relatively low compared to the rest of the world, but because there's been such a tightening towards safety, health, everybody's been, I would say, following um, regulations very well. So that's kind of, uh, you know, not saying that there's any light at the end of the tunnel because that means business is also hurting. And when you start to think about that, there's a lot of our, our small to medium sized businesses as well as the large hotel brands that are now revisiting, you know, how can we stay open? How do we keep our, our employees in this industry? So uh, it's, it's always that, um, balance and I would say Canada really has put health before uh, anything and um, that's why our numbers are what they are. I think when we also look though um, from a business events perspective we've got the majority of our conferences of course across the country have been, been cancelled all the way to the end of the year and we're looking at now um, when we're talking about international conventions that were already booked into Canada in 2021 how do these look? Um, are they in a tentative position when they were already in a confirmed position? And that's where we're noticing a lot of our city DMOs that are um, holding on tight as much as they possibly can, but um, being always nurturing the relationship with those clients to continue to tell them about what um, they've put in place in, say, in terms of safety and health protocols. And I think that is key. Uh, so the nurturing of the relationships. We have resumed marketing campaigns uh, last month into the U.S. and globally to talk about uh, the health and the safety and still talking about our, our, our overall leisure campaign is Canada Nice. And when you think about Canada Nice, um, you know, with what's going on right now around the, around the world, isn't it good for, you know, nice for everybody? So I think part of it is we all need this nurturing, this love, this, this feeling of goodness. And um, uh, if we continue to expand that through our, our target markets, um, we're hoping that that um, will resume when borders reopen. We are very sensitive to our neighbors to the south, understanding that there's, they're going through um, a lot from a lot of different areas and, and uh, a lot of different foundational things that may be changing uh, with an election upcoming. But um, very sensitive to that relationship and to continue nurturing as we know that Ipsos um, branding um, survey came out was it just last week where they asked internationally what the top three brands were that they thought from a country to visit um, post COVID and Canada was in the top three and not just that but Canada was number one from America from the US and so we know that when the borders start to reopen as long as we have our health and safety protocols 
we've got a lot of American Business Event Association clients that are ready to come back uh, to be in, in Canada. Okay, thank you, Chantal. It's interesting you brought up the Canada Nice campaign, and um, I've been working with Destination Canada on that. And there was some not quite sure how to proceed with that, but as it's turned out, it's been the most successful campaign in Destination Canada's history. Uh, the numbers are just through the roof. So clearly that's resonating with, with people now. Um, so you also talked about how city DMOs are responding and reacting. So Paul, in Victoria's case, they're a mid-sized city on Vancouver Island. Just how are you adjusting strategy and recontracting work? What's the general business climate there? Sure. Well, I think, thank you, Greg, and it's an honor to be here. I think I want to kind of chunk it up into kind of the immediate and then the medium term. And I don't think anyone's really doing long-term planning right now. Uh, but I think in the immediate, um, when all this happened and has continued to happen, I think our watchword became flexibility um, because we wanted to make sure that we were able to rebook whatever we could. And it was almost, it was very interesting. Um, we were set up to have our, by far our, our record conference year ever in 2020 with 39 citywides. And we just had to kind of emotionally let that go. Um, we were just poised for uh, an absolutely um, stunningly uh, positive year. Um, everything was working and was optimized within the destination in terms of how we work with the hotels, the conference center. Um, and, and it was just very sad to see all that business fall away. Uh, but we were able to rebook a lot of it. And then, and then the second piece would be health and safety. Um, and then the third is getting uh, crystal clear on your future proposition. So we've been working very hard. We've just received the, uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council's um, um, safety certificate uh, for safe travels. We're about to get our conference center um, certified as well too. Um, so those will be um, important little brands to move forward, uh, making sure that the value proposition is there and very basic things like making sure we have a studio for hybrid meetings in the short term. I think as we move into the medium term, because a lot of the business from 2020 is rebooking into 2021 and even into 2022, um, so there, I'm calling the next year almost like a big Tetris game, like fitting all the little pieces of business that were kind of already there and trying to make it work and get a high score. Um, but beyond 2021, when we do inevitably reopen, we need to be crystal clear on what our value proposition is, uh, both in terms of service and customer delivery, but also what the brand of the destination is vis-a-vis -vis meetings. And I think if we can come into when the marketplace reopens and when customers start to contract again with an even sharper um, unique selling proposition, I think we'll be in a good place to gain some market share in the mid-sized meeting space. Okay, and we'll get to that, that value proposition and how that's evolving in just a second. But, you know, one of numerous elephants in the room is funding and DMOs no longer have the resources in the short to medium term to help uh, attract or, and support uh, events. Could you talk a little bit about that and how you're adjusting. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Greg, because I think this is the elephant in the room, certainly in terms of the relationship between DMOs or destination organizations or convention visitors bureaus and planners. Um, you know, um, especially the last four or five years when things have been kind of frothy on the revenue side, we were able to be quite aggressive in terms of our business development activities. And that's kind of the untold and unspoken um, element in our whole business. But it, it we wouldn't stop at anything to try and outcompete our partners to try and win some business, right? Particularly during need periods, during the off-peak season. Um, and that's just not gonna be available for the next few years. So then, then if absent of that, um, or if that's gonna be much more modest, um, how can we add value? How can we be of service uh, to, um, uh, to uh, planners and our customers? And I think that's the area that we all need to look inward and, and, and also engage with our customer advisory boards in terms of making sure that we have a realistic expectation between the customer um, and, and the Bureau. Okay, great. So moving on to the next theme and looking at value proposition, what's so exciting about this group right here, the three of you, in terms of DC, Victoria and Canada, is that you've all embraced this sort of sector expertise strategy, what it's called, where you're promoting your expertise, uh, the strength of your clusters, to engage planners in those clusters. So really expanding beyond buildings to brain power, if you will. And not just the fact that you have those clusters, but more nuanced that you can provide access to that expertise to increase the value proposition uh, for planners for selecting your destinations. Um, Business Events Canada, for example, only now targets 
uh, groups that are you know, involved in, in one of your priority clusters. Uh, Chantel, can you expand on that just briefly and talk about how that strategy is evolving uh, based on COVID? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, we've aligned ourselves, Business Events Canada, with going after attracting business events from all three segments. So whether it be association, corporate meetings, as well as the incentive travel, um, aligning with our federal government's priority sectors. And we've chosen the five of them being advanced manufacturing, natural resources, uh, technology, um, uh, life sciences, and I think it's clean tech. So with, with these sectors, um, what we've noticed is uh, we've already done our research in Canada to identify where those centers of excellence are in Canada. And that within itself has allowed us to work with a lot more destinations in Canada versus the you know, four or five or six main ones that we've been engaging with um, for decades that seem to get a lot more business. If we're going to actually grow market share, we have to get everybody growing in each destination. And that has been, this sector strategy has helped rise um, the, the second and the third tier cities to be able to really find their strength in terms of what their ecosystem are, in terms of their academia, the financial support, whether it's municipal, provincial or federal, whether we've got the startups and the companies there, um, as well as the, um, the leaders from business. And when we started to do that research years ago, uh, that has enabled us to have unique selling uh, features because when you start to look into subsectors, you're going to get one destination that just um, is unbelievable in terms of what their strengths are um, within that destination that will blow away others across the world and globally. So it's really finding the, the needle in the haystack, if you want us to put it that way. One way that we've evolved this is instead of just looking inward in terms of what our sectors are, we've now, during COVID, um, we've already said that we were gonna be doing it starting January, but what COVID has done is it actually has just accelerated our strategy to move a little faster to be able to finish this research. We did the research on now, where do those five sectors, where are, are those clusters globally around the world? And we've done all that research to then identify 21 countries where our sectors are aligned with other sectors around the world and all the way down to certain destinations and cities within those countries to then say, what are the corporate headquarters, the Fortune 500 companies that are sitting in those, those areas in that country? Uh, what are the international associations that are there as well as what are the global incentive agencies that can help feed within it? What we've then started to now um, begin to reach out to is recognizing doing more research um, as we shifted our workforce. So our model right now from uh, workforce where we used to have very traditional salespeople in market um, knocking on the doors uh, like you know when you think about Washington as an example 65 different DMOs and hotel brands are there knocking on the same doors of the international American associations it's tough to try and find your unique selling proposition when you're doing it that way and what we then realized is we brought all of our intel up to Canada we've got our salespeople within Canada and their strengths are tied to whether it's natural resources and agribusiness or it's technology or it's life sciences, they've then done um, extra research during COVID to check out the trends. What is going on due to COVID? You can start to look at what impact it's had on whether it's supply chains, whether it's had uh, in terms of, um, you know, everything from our export or importing um, products into Canada and which ones are resilient. And that is the key now in this post uh, pandemic is is coming out of the gate knowing which ec economies are resilient within Canada are also resilient around the globe so that we're actually going into knocking on those doors first no use knocking on a door of an international association where their their economy is not doing very well at all um, they're still trying to figure out how they're even going to be staying afloat so I think part of that is being really smart and being focused so it's a global approach but very focused and understanding the trends along with your own country and understanding what you're, what's going on in, in and around the world. The last tie is to our value system in Canada. We're here as a Canadian country and making sure that um, we, we are aligned with our federal government to attract conferences that will hopefully improve uh, our country. So economically as well as socially and culturally. And that's where we start to think, well, if it's clean tech as an example, how do we get more of those conferences that are going to come to Canada because they're tied to our value system in terms of sustainability and really understanding our culture. And so that's where there's that tie to economic 
that we've taken it even further into social and cultural side of, of uh, the meetings of business events. Okay. Uh, Elliot, I want to move on to you next, but as we discussed earlier, I want to give credit where credit's due. This whole sector expertise strategy really came out of the, the Great Recession in 2010 or so, and I remember it was a premier or prime minister in, in Australia who said, we need to be more innovative than anyone else because we're hanging off the arse end of the world. That was his quote. And then speaking uh, with Matthias Schultz in Germany in 2011, he said, you know, in Europe, everyone has a new convention center and a 13th century church nearby. So we have to be more innovative than everywhere else. So this has been a conversation that's been happening globally for a while. But really in North America, where I first saw it, it really take hold was in, in Washington, D.C. And, and everything that Destination D.C. did there, starting with tech and then moving on to government and education and, and really providing research and content around the expertise in those sectors. More importantly, also the diversity in those sectors and all the venture capital and leadership um, across, the, across the city, across all types of cultural groups and audiences as well. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that has played out for you and how that's going to help lead uh, the DMO and the city um, out of COVID? Uh, absolutely, Greg. Uh, you know, the reality is uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. The international market, Canadian market, has done a far better job for a longer period of time of, um, of understanding and, and, and looking at specific segments. Whereas in the U.S., we have tend to focus on come to our destination because we're where you need to be and perhaps the infrastructure of getting here and hotel room and size of convention center uh, is what you need and, and um, you'll have a great experience now. Goodbye, have a good meeting. Um, the international market has done a better job uh, in terms of building relationships tied to specific markets and assets that they have um, in their own backyard. And to your point, Greg, over a decade ago and probably more in the last five years, we've done more of the same thing. You know, as Chantal was speaking of specific segments, um, you know, biotech, pharma, medical, education, sustainability, transportation, and advocacy, those are uh, key markets that have been pretty big in the DC area, but the one that really got the most attention is government. It's kind of like one of those things where people just assume that, you know, you don't have to really go fishing, just put your boat in the water and the fish will jump in in DC because meetings just automatically happen. Um, and as much as we'd like to think that that's the case, we have to be more creative in terms of going after business that we want. Um, you know, very few will actually admit that there's business that wants us and that there's business that we want. And we all want the business that's going to, that has the largest economic impact. So why not look at the resources that are in your backyard, starting with the, the, the industries that are here, um, and then tie that into how government plays a role be it um, focusing on, um, you know, all those sectors that are important. And then what speakers we have in our backyard. Because of these sectors, because of the 180 plus embassies we have in DC, because of all the major corporations that have lobbying office here, a lot offices here, why go elsewhere to get a speaker when there might be someone in your backyard? Why, why bring, uh, why not look at some of the brain trust that's here in terms of, um, um, subjects and topics for your meetings um, and let us help you by assembling a group of professionals that are here that have done that have you know something that's been done in Europe and in Canada for a long time in Asia that will be able to help us attract that business to our destination so it's it's yes we still want them to have a great experience and eat in our restaurants and do all the fun things but we want their experience to also be tied to the value added of not having to pay for speakers to come in, the value added uh, add of the industries that perhaps they're involved with or looking at engaging that are right here in Washington, D.C. or in our backyard. You know, the Amazon's the second headquarters that has gotten global attention that's being built across the river uh, from Washington, D.C., but literally in our backyard. How do we harness that industry and tie that into opportunity to bring meetings to our destination? So, and it's been very help, very, very lucrative and, you know, just assembling those, 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 the, the unique thing about uh, Americans is that unlike the global community, it's very difficult for us to get 
a, a, a specific person that is a expert in an industry that, that wants to bring the meeting to, to Washington or to the US because they want to go somewhere else and it's too much work. Whereas globally, they're accustomed to it. They see it as a rite of passage. They see it as a, you know, we are honored to host your meeting in our country, therefore in our city. So we've had to do some finessing in terms of building that relation, those relationships with the Smithsonian's and all the talent that's right here, uh, and then make this something that they're really um, engaged in and, and, and interested in doing, especially if we want other seg seg segments to grow, especially the international mice market segment that we've been going after in Washington. And I think both for you and for Chantal, just to build on this to a degree, and we talked about this years ago at South by Southwest where Washington DC brought, you know, the, the most innovative and bright minds to uh, Austin. And we're not just talking about advanced industries, but really the creative industries and all of the ecosystem that goes around that. So you're not just coming, you know, to learn about nuclear medicine, but also all of the creative um, and innovative developments that are happening in the destination, which sparks and inspires, you know, ambitious minds. And um, I think, you know, when we look at, at Canada, you look at an event like C2 Montreal, which is a lot like South by Southwest. It's a lot more than just, you know, tech and innovation. And the Montreal Innovation Quarter talks about, we have to look at innovation across all types of different realms. So I just want to sort of expand that conversation. But now what's really exciting here uh, when you look at a, a city like Victoria, Canada, is where this sector expertise strategy was once the purview of the Sydneys and the Washington DCs and the Berlins. But as Chantal alighted on, it's now really giving a new story for mid-size cities, whether that's, uh, you know, the fact that Fort Worth has Bell helicopters uh, in their area. So the future mobility um, agri-tech and new forms of biofuels in the prairies of Canada. In Victoria, the ocean cluster is really big. Paul, can you just talk a little bit about how that's helping you tell a new story for Victoria and how that's going to help steward you um, through the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's, what's really interesting is um, uh, I'm just going to build on a point that Elliot made. It comes back to a, a talent and uh, basically the, uh, the brain trust that is there. And we're blessed in our mid-sized city to have um, true, authentic clusters of thought leadership in, in, in areas that are um, true to who we are as a place. And that includes uh, marine, uh, the marine industries, whether that be heavy industry, or whether that be marine tech, because we are on an island on an ocean, um, or whether that be clean tech or kind of more uh, the enviro or sustainable industries, because that's the ethic and the ethos of who we are as a community. Um, so when we talk about these vertical sectors, um, we have them and it helps us tell our story and attract really interesting business and we have the various facilities whether that be the ocean um, uh, networks facility at University of Victoria or the uh, industries that have spun off of it or other things like that but we're able to you know make it a very clear and distinct proposition that if you're in those segments or you're associated with those segments um, you're going to have a wonderful um, convention experience, but you're also going to have an incredible learning experience as well, too. So, um, you know, it, it has not entirely replaced our traditional meetings or association business because, you know, while we're not Washington, D.C., we are provincial capital, so we do get our fair share of um, association business as well, too. But every year, it's just kind of taking a little bit more, which is good because it's, um, it's a value add. It's a higher yield. And it also creates alignment within the community and, and it builds civic pride because people aren't just coming here because the weather's nice and we have nice hotels. Um, you know, a meeting planner of either a Canadian or, or a North American or a global entity has deliberately chosen our destination to bring their delegates or their events to because they think we have something special to offer in terms of a learning opportunity. And that helps us create more confidence as a, as a meeting destination. It ties into economic development activities, cluster building and other uh, pieces. So we're really, um, kind of shedding our skin as, as what was once viewed as kind of a ticky tacky tourism destination 10 or 15 years ago to be kind of a mid-sized powerhouse in some, um, in some distinct uh, segments. And um, it makes a job like mine and my teams a lot more interesting. We're learning about different things, um, but we still get all the visceral joy of bidding and winning on conferences as well too, which is also a lot of fun. And just, go ahead, Chantal. 
I was just going to maybe just talk a little bit about uh, combining the two. And I know, um, Elliot, when you had mentioned about uh, the ambassadors of those, those, those local champions, I think this is where it has been key right now when we're trying to tell that Canadian story. Um, our, our director that goes around with the, from economic sectors um, on our team goes around Canada and she had gone from coast to coast to coast to all of our cities to really see their, their ecosystems from the sector side. And the people that she met and the champions that she had connected with that would talk so highly of their subject matter, whatever it may be when we did C2 in Montreal, it's the arts and technology put together whether it is, you know, um, ocean technology. Um, you know, what, what we have discovered is we talk back to Canada Nice and talk back to our campaign of our people. And that's really, um, yes, we're selling the knowledge capital that we have, but it's also that human side that when you start getting people talking about things that they love, like all of us here, um, it just becomes, uh, when you're talking about the speaker, they organically talk about the destination uh, that has allowed their career to prosper, that has allowed their business to, to do well. And I think that's where we found a lot of um, tie with our immigration. We've, got a, we've always had a very strong immigration policy in Canada. And we have had, uh, I would say Virginie, as she's gone across the country, has met a lot of those champions that have chosen to come to Canada, chosen to work as a PhD in virology, Dr. Vikram out of Saskatoon, who has then um, attracted, uh, you know, numerous, uh, a dozen international virology type of conferences from around the world. He's from uh, another country to begin with, has chosen our country, has decided to stay in a small third tier city and prospers and loves it. So when he's talking about it, he ends up being someone who's passionate about his subject matter as well as his destination. And that's when DMO is really, I always say, those are the best people that can help sell your, your city for you because they actually are, they, they're twofold within their message. And I think that's where really identifying and finding those key people um, uh, is, is key to growing your own market and your own segment. And then it's the trade and the investment that also helps grow that, uh, you know, yes, there's the business event that comes and, you know, yes, they've been able to share best practices with others that are like-minded and be able to capitalize on our speakers. And, uh, but it's also what they leave once they leave there. It's, whether those, there, there's trade that happens between some of our local um, exhibitors and those companies, it's also the trade and, and, and it's the investment that perhaps some of those companies have then decided to invest in some of those speakers that we're talking in their companies. So I think it just goes so much further into uh, that economic sphere of growing um, your destination. And that's where it's going to be really critical in the recovery process of COVID. I totally agree. I'll, I'll, I'll just add real quick, Greg. They're also better salespeople than we are. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, honest, honestly, it's our job to talk about, you know, no one wants me to say, come to DC, I think. But when, when peer to peer, they're talking about where they live to someone who's in their career field or in their profession, and they see and they hear from that individual how amazing our destination is, it's a different type of sell. So, you know, that's, that's the component that you cannot forget um, as you're looking at. Um, using these champions that are in your and experts that are in your own backyard. Well, th that brings up a great point, and both of you, thank you, um, Paul. When it comes to connecting people in the community and being a catalyst or a platform for developing those ambassadors and offering them opportunities to help drive the future of the destinations, a few years ago you created the, the DMO. Greater Destination Victoria and some partners created the Sustainability Travel and Tourism Conference. And it's been, it's been a big success in terms of, I think, how it's brought the community together, not just in all the thought leadership, but how it's brought all different people from public and private sector, uh, through different industries together to really show Victoria in another light. Now you as a DMO helped create that and that's always been a conversation. Is that a good idea? But it just depends, of course. But can you provide some of the takeaways about what that event has done for your city? Sure, and thanks, Greg. And what you're referencing is the Impact Sustainable Travel and Tourism Conference, which we co-created with three other business partners 
Um, and it is always a risky proposition for a DMO to be involved in the ownership of an event. Um, there's case studies good and there's case studies negative. And, um, uh, but it is very much ingrained in the model in Australia. And that's where we uh, specifically um, modeled it from and specifically Adelaide and their, their bureau is involved in the ownership of 17 different events. So, um, and that, that really helps round out um, their calendar. And it's a similar size city. So that's why, you know, when I coined this strategy four or five years ago, I thought it was worth the risk. But the fact to the actual conference itself, um, that's all not only been good in terms of catalyzing discussion around uh, the future of sustainable tourism and meetings, which is something that we need to have anyways, um, for a variety of reasons. But it, that has also attracted um, other conferences around it. Uh, we have one, I, I'm counting about 11 now, additional meetings who have deliberately come to Victoria because they want to um, uh, draft on the halo that the Impact Sustainable Tourism Conference has created. Uh, so I never envisioned that. I kind of joked with our business partners when we started this that we would like to make this uh, the Sundance of sustainable tourism, you know, and that's an awkward word anyways, or an awkward phrase, but we'd like to kind of create a brand halo effect where those who are truly interested in that subject matter make it um, kind of a mandatory stop every January to come to Victoria and get their annual dose of, in of inspiration and ideas about how to translate this very important topic into reality. So, but it aligns with our clean tech sector strategy it also aligns with just the ethos of the city that we have here in, in Victoria. It's a very unique city. Um, you know, things like Greenpeace started here many, many years ago, where the center of the Green Party um, is political strength in Canada. So I think, you know, doing business and being profitable and being sustainable is not a trade off. It's just part of how we live here. And um, we've adapted to that and um, kind of turned it into something that's gained a, a quite a bit of traction. Okay. I just want to drive that home impact in January in Victoria because it's really the only dedicated conference talking about travel and tourism and business events through the lens of sustainability only dedicated event like that in North America so um, and I think as we come out of the pandemic everyone is much more focused on that and everything that you're doing there will be all that much more valuable all right so for this session, we really want to try and provide some inspiration and hope and optimism for the future. So just want to you know, ask each of you, maybe starting with you, Chantel, you know, where do you see opportunity in the next, in the short, medium, long term, whichever way you want to talk about that for, for Canada from a national perspective? Well, I think, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, opportunity, of course, is that, um, we're trying to regain the business, especially from the incentive side and the corporate meetings that we've had, but especially from the incentive, we've got a lot of very large uh, headquartered companies in Canada that have um, you know, sent their top performers of their leadership teams on incentive trips around the globe um, for decades. And to be able to recapture right now when doing a refocus, we've got a lot of our city DMOs that have turned their attention to our domestic market. Um, and are now knocking on the doors for the first time to some of these Canadian companies. Uh, and those Canadian companies, I think from, from that angle, it's getting to know your own backyard a little bit back again. Uh, it's perhaps not in your own city. We're all you know, pretty vast travelers in Canada. Uh, we travel our own country, but we also travel a lot internationally. And so I think this is gonna be a way for us to regain that confidence of our own Canadians in our own backyard within the incentive side. Um, I think it's also helped with the modeling. Uh, we've got a lot of DMCs, if I just stay on the incentive side for a second, a lot of DMCs currently that have um, revisited or pivoted their model for business to really think about perhaps incentives when they do come back won't be coming back in big numbers. How do I capture in a short to medium term um, in perhaps looking at, at incentive groups to come to Canada, especially with our unique selling propositions that we have. Canada's vast, Canada's huge, Canada's wide open spaces. When you're thinking COVID, you don't want to be around a bunch of people in a hustle bustle type of place. Um, and so that's where um, our, a lot of our resort and our outdoors and our nature really kind of comes into play. And um, has we have that ability where we already have the infrastructure of very well maintained, uh, beautiful properties that are resorts in different areas of the country from coast to coast. So I think that's where um, 
Uh, unfortunately, we're going to see a shift from urban centers for a bit in terms of the meetings to uh, uh, more outdoors, perhaps even what they're going to be able to create in terms of team building that are going to be in the outdoors, whether it would be the Banffs and the Whistlers and the Mont Tremblants and, and also different unique uh, destinations. That's where I think our second and third tier cities are going to be able to capture a little bit more business on that angle as well. Um, I think we still have to keep our, our, our major cities, though, sustainable and, and growing. Um, they're the heartbeat. They are where a lot of the corporations are sitting. So we still have to find a way to get them out within their own city to start having those meetings, I think, um, on, on an initial short term. But I think the overarching brand of Canada coming out of all this uh, has been positive. Uh, we just have to make sure that now we're going to be going after, I know very much to our sister country down south, uh, knowing that there's the, the political atmosphere may change, may not change. So really uh, waiting to see uh, what that will come because we understand that there's either going to be more of a, you know, local within the U.S. or there might be more of that open trade uh, within um, Canada. So that's where some of those quicker opportunities, I would say, would be coming. And globally, we know that the international business is going to take a longer to come, even with a strong brand. Um, they're also having to combat their own numbers and trying to reboot their own economy. So I think if you were to ask me, Cole's Notes version is Canada first, as we all know, um, then U.S., then global. And I think within our uh, segments of, of meetings, um, the association business, uh, Canadian wide, um, has they're they're working on their new models. I think we're going to see a lot of the um, our, our destinations seeing a lot of Canadian business, whether it's in all segments, um, stay home for a while. Okay, thank you, Chantal. Um, Elliot, you've developed these sort of frameworks, uh, the connected capital program, if you will, which speaks to how DC can connect planners with and their groups with that intellectual capital. You also have the connected campus idea where you have the convention center and all different types of venues and you can bring groups and break them out. And the, it's really the city is then the venue. Um, is that a key piece to coming out of, of COVID and, and how is that evolving? Well, let's just say that there is no model tied to our marketing in the past that will help us come out of where we are without safety being the priority and cleaning standards. And, you know, the consumer confidence has been compromised and rightfully so. Um, we're still in a pandemic. And even though, unfortunately, uh, politics have played a role in that in the U.S. where some people don't think that we are, um, the data proves that we are, um, the number of, 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 of deaths that we have in our country. Um, you know, we, we, we want to we look at um, connected campus, connected capital. We've got to, we, we almost have to put that on pause and, and, and rethink it. So for us right now, it's what can we do with the assets that we have that will create a virtual slash in-person meeting environment as it as we look at 2021, because, you know, 2020, we were all in a reactionary stage, whereas things were canceled and, and didn't happen. But in 2021, people want to get, you know, we're trying to get back to some degree of normalcy, whatever that is. Um, and part of that is going to be, how can a, a meeting or a Congress that would have been 10,000 people still have 2,000 people come to Washington with 8,000 people um, tuning in? And um, so therefore you have some combination thereof. But even as we look at that, you know, Greg, it's all about, um, you know, I, I can tell you how amazing my suite is and how great my hotel is and my food and beverage program. But if I'm not making it a priority to tell you what the standards are in terms of safety, and is it a mandatory thing to wear a mask in my establishment, then I'm probably gonna lose out on more than I'm going to win. So, um, you know, the, the negative for us is a, in DC, we, I like to think that we're on top of that because our mayor, who also is our governor, is very proactive on, on these standards. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's face it, in the US, you've got 50 states, you've got the district, you've got various territories, and each one has a different philosophy, which is so uniquely different than the rest of the global community. Whereas in Australia, 
let me, let me not say Australia. In any other country, once mm -hmm. the government shuts it down or makes a prayer, makes a puts a mandate in place, everyone has to follow suit. So our goal right now is to talk about our infrastructure, but equally as much make sure that people understand the, the standards that are in place so that we can get back on track. Um, the reality is the leisure market has to rebound first um, mm -hmm. to the point that Chantal and Paul made, the international market, you know, it's not in my radar for the next 12 months in terms of international visitation. I'd like to see it come back, but even when those borders reopen, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with a lot of other variables, including the, the news and the media and the concern about coming to the U.S. So, um, you know, we, we are definitely going to get back on track, and those are very much so priorities as, as pertains to our marketing, but we're looking at uh, making sure that the, the traveling industry community, the meetings industry understands what's in place in terms of safety protocol in, in all, of our biz, all of our establishments. Okay, good. Paul, wrapping up in Victoria, you know, when I travel around working with different cities, everyone wants to know who's doing it best, who's doing it well. And in the mid-sized city realm, I always bring up Victoria. You're your mayor, Mayor Lisa, helps develop the Victoria 3.0 Economic Development Study, which includes emphasis on, you know, funding a new convention center because that's what attracts people and talent, and that's how you uh, promote the Victoria brand to the world and very much ties in all of the clusters uh, and the meetings, uh, bringing people together around those clusters, and building those those clusters in the destination. It's I always point to Victoria as sort of the city of the future. How can you leverage that more, maybe both on the leisure and meeting side? How do you see that evolving? I know there's still a lot of challenges in the destination, of course, but just, just kind of looking to you to provide a bit of a crystal ball for the future or where you would like to see things go. Yeah, well, thank you. And so, Greg, thank you for that. And of course, I, I live it day to day, so uh, I may not always have as road colored <laughs> glasses as, as you do, but I, I do see the potential there. We are working towards it. I think to situate things where mid-sized city that's growing rapidly. So a decision that's already been taken has been to adopt smart city protocols in terms of um, transportation, connectivity, our various sub-governments working together. We want to be connected as a smart city. We do have a thriving technology sector uh, here in Victoria, again, because of um, the lifestyle, uh, which has attracted um, um, investment and, and just a talent into the, into the region. Um, our our forward-looking mayor, who who is we have two years left with her. She's not going to run again. She's done completed. Two, she will complete two terms, but she understands the link between these economic sectors and the need to convene. And I, I'm I'm using the word convening more, almost in a uh, almost like Socrates would in 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 ancient Greek. You know, the the need for Greece, the need for dialogue, the need for shared experiences to help pro propel a democracy forward. Um, and whether that's, a, whether that's to, um, um, you know, advance economic clusters or sectors, or also whether it's to a, advance social causes. You know, um, a lot of our conventions are around passive housing, um, a lot of, to do with Indigenous justice and other things. You know, you, you have to have conversations to solve the big problems in society. So, um, and you need a venue for that. So that's kind of the magic of, of, of linking all the elements in Victoria 3.0. We want to be a place where dialogue happens and you need the facilities for that. Um, so I, there, there is a, there's absolutely no disconnect between uh, a vertical sector strategy, the need for people to convene, whether it's in the business sector, the association sector or the social sector, and the need for the, the DMO or the destination organization to have an absolutely crisp value proposition, proposition and then the services to make our, our meeting planner, professional conference organizers, and DMC customers satisfied. So if you've tied it all together, the final piece I'd like to overlay is this idea of, of justice and particularly economic justice. Um, uh, just that can be framed in many different ways in, in the current environment, but something that I've spoken about on a different podcast series is we do not want our industry to be one that's exploitative. We do not want the benefits to just accrue to a handful of people who may have been blessed through colonialism to have land or to have um, been in the business for, you know, a hundred years. I would like to work on systems and frameworks that the economic benefits of the visitor economy, whether that be on the leisure side or on the meeting side, accrue to a broad variety of, of individuals. I haven't landed on it yet, but I think that's one of our next big challenges as a, as a sector 
is to be more inclusive economically. And so, um, but to do that, as I always say, to distribute wealth, we need to attract it first. So I think we're really kind of um, honing in on our ability to attract um, revenue. And um, the next five to 10 years, once we come out of, of the pandemic, which has exposed differences in socioeconomic strata, right? You know, uh, um, we need our industry to be a force for good in that space to continue to, to have our, the oxygen we need to go forward. And that's a pretty exciting proposition. And, um, you know, we're talking about it now, we're strategizing about it now. The trick will be to translate that into initiatives, which will drive outcomes. Yeah, that's, a, I think, a good thing to end on, this idea that the pandemic has accelerated a lot of things that we've been talking about or accelerating the future um, and making it more real. I know IBM Retail Index came out last week saying that the pandemic accelerated e-commerce by five years. In the meetings and events sector, when we talk about the future, this pandemic is definitely moving us faster into things that maybe we just talked about now and we need to make it real. I just want to thank the three of you uh, for, for Canada, Victoria and DC because the rest of us looks to the three of you for driving that industry in North America especially. So thank you all for participating. Thank you all for the, the great insight and I hope we get a chance to meet at IMAX next year in person. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks Greg. You Thanks, did a great Greg. job too. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Well done. Bye now. Bye. Bye.